the stabilizing factor of bundle, I think, kind of restricts movement, right? You can easily do that on an exhale, as you say, but it kind of, due to its very stabilizing nature, it's hard to move with bundle. But you can keep with the expansive nature of bundle. I'm assuming that you could actually move within that that state whilst yeah. holding a certain kind of, shall we, well, shall we call it tension within the abdomen, which is a, a kind of right tension, you know, an awareness, but without yes. a, 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 you know, a literal tension. Uh, the ideal form of bandha for posture and for, you know, especially the yoga practices that we tend to do should be one where you can breathe diaphragmatically because that's what's going to give the parasympathetic mm. dominance. Mm. And you should also be able to move the core because the core is your kanda. The kanda is the, the seat of 72,000 nadis. It's a special, um, it's, it's like central station. You know, you can imagine, mm. you know, a country will have lots of stations, lots of railway stations, yes. some are more yeah. major, but then one country will have the super central station. And then the major stations are your chakras, you know, and, and, and the, the major station of the body is the kanda. So if, again, I lower the camera a little bit here, we have Muladhara chakra is, is you know, between the, um, the pelvic floor. Swadhisthana chakra is behind the pubic bone. Manipura chakra behind the navel. And then Anahata, Vishuddhi, and Ajna and crown chakra up here. But the kanda is directly between the pubic bone and the navel, which is actually between Swadhisthana and Manipura. And it's called the kanda in Indian yoga. It's the same place that's called the Dantian in China. Yes. Yoga, yes. And it's called the Hara in Japan. And that kanda must be able to be movable. If you, if you so is that it, where we're looking at? Is that where we're looking at from to move from? Yes. Rather than you know, because yes. usually when people think we're moving from the core, I think we're looking to localize a place which is slightly below the navel, as I understand it. But you're, what you're suggesting is that we're moving from a place between, say, the between the solar plexus or the the xiphoid process and and the uh, the lower abdomen, right, and the navel. It's, it's a bit higher. No, the place than... that you're moving from is actually between the navel and the pubic bone here. So it's below the, below the navel. Oh, right. So it's still, okay, I thought you were pointing so a place yeah. a bit higher than that, right? So you're moving from there. That's... I, I am. So if I draw my... Often people talk about drawing the lower abdomen in. So if I do that, you see my lower abdomen is coming in. See, it's the lower abdomen. But when I do that, my upper abdomen is still soft. Most people can't do that. That lower abdomen is an essential ingredient of learning pranayama, especially when it comes to yeah. doing the exhalation. Yeah. And if you, and the, you can create a mula bandha just with transverse abdominals, where I can pull my navel to my spine and it goes in very softly. It's soft still. So show for the, for the, for the uh, watchers, what should we call them? Yeah. Watchers, viewers. Watchers, Where's the Dantian? Dantian I'm used, I'm used to saying listenership. The the pubic bone. So it's, underneath so it's the about navel there. Navel okay. And above yeah. the pubic bone. Yeah. And from behind, it's yeah. below the level of the top of the hips. And yes. The L5 right. of S1. And yeah. That's the, the Dantian. It's also the Kanda. That's where the breath should actually feel like the expansion is starting from. Yeah. Yeah. And I wanted to, I mean, because due to time restraints on this uh, format, I wanted you to talk a little bit about your system of movement because it seems like this is this understanding of the way that breath moves the body, the way that you're moving from this this certain area informs greatly your movements, which to some people seem unusual, um, and they well they are unusual and they very much symbolise the way that you look at practice. I mean, why did you say stop? Or, or never, you know, fully commit to the Ashtanga practice and and develop your system of movement. What is it that 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 is qualifying the way that you move? That's uh, that that defines your system of of uh, of moving because it is oh, unique to you. I, I still love doing the Ashtanga practice. It's, it's I know you love the Ashtanga practice, but your general practice is, uh, you know, is yeah. is different to other than that, right? And and I why is that? And how does that? Enough. What's what? Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's, um, it's, it's just very difficult to share with the masses. You know? it's, it's, um, it's, I know, it's actually, because you, you take it quite literally, and, and the, the, the demands that, you know, when, you, when you're reading the Mula, the, uh, the Yoga Mala, etc., and you're taking three years, uh, literally put the weight in the hands and lift up. Yeah, if you're going to teach that to the general audience, you, you, you know, it's, it's very high, high end and demanding, yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, but that's, you can easily take that out. It's almost people have an idea that they should be able to do something that 
relates to it. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so again, what, what did you ask me? <laughs> Specify. Well, I suppose, the, I suppose the idea of uh, the underpinning of your movement system, which is moving very much what I see, the way you're moving is, is quite spiral-like in nature. There's a lot of flow. There's lots of circular movements. There's very much an understanding of moving. You're constantly moving from that lower area. I can see that clearly in your, the way you move. And I can see that there's something very particular you're doing with the breathing. And you often talk in, in what you put out as breathing less, you know, conserving breath, um, minimizing uh, effort, or, you know, there's a certain kind of, uh, you know, economy of effort there. Um, yeah. yeah, so I just wanted you to clarify your intentions and your foundation within this movement system, if people don't know you and uh, and the way that you, you, you move. So yeah. when my, my basis is to work in a way where you get maximum health on a physical, physiological and mental level, so for that, I can't just focus on the muscles and joints. I also want to work on internal organs. So I try and make it so the breath that I do works physically to help the muscles and the joints, but also helps to physically massage the internal organs. And to do that, you have to mobilize your spine. And at the same time, then when you're using your breath, you want to minimize the amount of air that comes in and out. You can still use your muscles of breathing, but not much air has to come in and out to do that. And the less air you can get by with, the better it is. Because oxygen is always, we have enough. What we need to do is build up carbon dioxide. So when you can learn to do the same activity with less air, you actually get more oxygen to the cells, you get better blood flow to the brain, you get a much calmer nervous system, you're less hungry. So pranayama is the art of learning how to breathe less. And in terms of... What you mentioned, um, let's just rewind a second and, and ask you why you need to build up carbon dioxide. I mean, this, this whole idea now is coming more to the fore that actually what we need is not more oxygen necessarily, but to tolerate carbon dioxide in the body. Can you explain that a little yes, bit more? Yes, of course. Yeah, mm. the, um, the thing about uh, breathing is that when we are taking the air that comes into our nose, it has about 20% oxygen, about 80% nitrogen, right? Within that, there's also 0.5% carbon dioxide. So we're breathing in 20% oxygen, 0.5% carbon dioxide, but at a cellular level, to get the oxygen out of our red blood cells and put it into our body cells, you need to have uh, oxygen at about 7%, and carbon dioxide at about 7%. So one of the most important uh, features and purposes of breathing is to reduce the oxygen that comes into your lungs threefold, to take it from 20 and cut it down to 7%, and to increase the carbon dioxide 14-fold to bring it from 0.5% to 7%. And so mm. the more you breathe, the more you blow out carbon dioxide. And the less you breathe, the more carbon dioxide builds up. We always have enough oxygen, pretty much, right, up to a certain level. So when you We're get, taking in enough oxygen, but we're not processing enough oxygen, right? You can increase you what you're trying to, you're still trying to increase oxygen levels, but not through simply just by taking big gulps of yes. breath. There's still the idea that, that we need oxygen, we need more oxygen, right? In, in terms of the movement that we're doing, you know, if we're moving more vigorously, we need more oxygen. Yes. But it's not just through obviously taking more breath that we get more oxygen. Is that, that's what you're saying, I, I think. Exactly. You, to yeah, get yeah. The oxygen where it's needed, it has to go into yeah. your cells. And there's yeah. a very important concept which is called the Bohr effect, B-O-H-R. And this Bohr effect was discovered about uh, more than 100 years ago. I think it was the father of Niels Bohr, the famous physicist, who discovered this. And it basically says that the red blood cells, which have oxyhemoglobin, this red pigment in the blood which carries the oxygen, mm. that will only release its oxygen to give it to your body cells where it's got to go, only if there are sufficient levels of carbon dioxide. And if you're hyperventilating, 
if you're breathing too much air per minute, that will mean that the carbon dioxide that would normally be building up inside you, say when you're breathing naturally like at a sleep, that carbon dioxide is expelled. And then if there's not enough carbon dioxide in your blood, the oxygen will simply stay attached to the red blood cells and you will not get it in your cells. It might be lots of oxygen running around your blood, but unless it leaves the blood cells and goes inside your body cells, it's useless. Mm. It's only when the oxygen gets inside the cells. But to get the oxygen inside the cells, you need carbon dioxide. To create carbon dioxide, you have to cut down the amount of breathing. So you're act actively in your practice, tr you're trying to breathe less. I mean, because in you know, yeah, as you well know, in the Ashtanga practice, this is an idea of five breaths to the movement and and deeper breathing is generally encouraged, right? You know, taking a fuller breath. Yes. But when you're moving and you're doing your particular practices, you you're you're holding a breath. Or... No, if if, if no. say for example, I'm doing Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga, and I'm doing a Surya Namaskar. Then what I'm doing is I'm moving in such a way that I'm holding most of the time the bandhas in such a way that the bandhas, when done the way I believe Patavi Joyce was asking us to do, then the volume of the lungs decreases. And so normally, if we're sitting relaxed, our lung volume would say be five liters. So if right now, as we're talking, if you make a normal breath in, a normal breath out, that's about one-tenth of the full feature of our lungs. It's only about 500 mils in a normal breath in, normal breath out. Mm. But if you breathe in fully and breathe out fully, you're exhaling about five liters. But if you do, say, lolasana, if, assuming you can do it, just even for a beginner, they just cross leg it and lift it up off the floor and held it there for a bit, and they tried to take a full breath in, if they did it without force, they'd notice that they can't breathe in as much as normal because the compression of the chest, which is the Uddiyana Bandha, and that tightening of the abdomen using rectus abdominis, that will not inhibit the diaphragm, but it makes it so when you breathe in to the point of not forcing, your lungs will be full once you've only taken 500 mils of air. And then, mm. in addition, when you exhale passively, say doing lolasana, the trini, then the passive exhale will pretty much empty your lungs completely. So the thing is, when you do bandha, the way Patabi Joyce, I believe, from my years with him, was explaining, you're actually changing lung volume with the correct bandha in a way that a natural breath in and a passive breath out, natural diaphragmatic breath in and a passive breath out, makes it feel like you're doing full breath in, full breath out. But a full breath in, full breath out with the bandhas he wanted are very small breaths, even less right. than 500 mils. So you, mm. I, I also do the Ashtanga Yoga then, and I'm doing a count for five breaths. I do five counts, five breaths, but they're tiny breaths. But when I'm breathing, right. I feel them go up my back, down my front, I engage the lower abdomen to exhale. But what I'm doing, this is what you started asking me at the start, is I'm doing my movement in a way that causes the breath to happen. I begin the movements of my spine and the movements of my trunk and the movements of the whole core, which manifests as the trunk, in mm. such a way that it makes the breath happen. The movement and the breath actually work together. And when you yeah. move the trunk properly, what happens is there's an expansion and a compression of the trunk and that expansion so there's movement in in the posture itself yes when you're when yeah. you're because i mean often another another aspect is i think often mistaken about the ashtanga series is that when you're in the posture you hold it rigid without fidgeting without moving at all but it, it seems an anathema to me that you know when you are breathing we are inherently moving the, the breath the diaphragm moves the body and so within the posture there's an ebb and flow of of a breath movement. and of movement within yes. the very shape. Yeah, yes, and, and very much so. And, and you really emphasize that in your system of movement because yes. when I see you moving, it's, it's, consist it's consistently yes. fluid. Because yeah. unless, unless there's movement on the inside, you're dead. So it might look stationary on the outside, but it's that movement of the inside that makes you feel alive, that gives you the life. 
So when I'm teaching people how to breathe in the way I want them to breathe, I'll get them to move their whole body. But once mm. they understand that, that yeah. movement, which I, I teach them by moving their whole body, I get yes. them to make it happen just from the stuff from the inside, and then the outside can be completely still. Yes, exactly. So yeah. That that I do by showing them how to work with the diaphragm, but also to breathe diaphragmatically up into your spine, into your chest, and eventually into your neck and into your throat. The teachers I had from India would be able to breathe into every chakra point, to breathe into their throat, to breathe into their into their eyes. You know, it was amazing. What mm-hmm. they could do. And. How this do you do that in Ashtanga? Because, I mean, I can see that you've got this kind of undulation. I see a lot of your movements in, in, in what you post and the way you're moving. How do you, I mean, could you teach that in Ashtanga system, which seems a lot more linear than the way that you're moving, oh, which, no, uh, which I, I, is, I, I, uh, you know, uh, and you can teach, and you, uh, how would you, how would you uh, manifest that, that same understanding so in, in a more linear so system? Is on the exhalation, I initiate the exhalation, by going in like that. So yeah. from the front, it'll look like I'm exhaling like that. But what I'm doing yeah. is I'm exhaling and I push in the lower back, then I, I go up the spine and then I push in the chest. Then when I right. inhale, I open the pelvic floor and I expand the back and then the chest expands. Then the abdomen expands. From the front, it will look like I'm breathing into the chest and breathing out to the lower abdomen. So my breath yeah. would be able, maybe you can see from here, so it looks like I, I inhale and then I exhale. I don't think you can see it from here. The no, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm getting an idea. I yeah. mean, I'm just in, it, 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 yeah. It looks like I'm breathing in the chest and breathing out to my lower abdomen. But in fact, what I'm doing is the inhalation to me feels like an expansion in my pelvic floor first, then my lower back, then my upper back, then my chest, and then my abdomen. That's the inhalation. Then the exhalation is contracting the lower abdomen first. Then I'm massaging and pushing in my lower back, upper back, then the chest and the abdomen. And I can do that whether I let air in or not. I can move my trunk and it looks like I'm breathing, but I'm not breathing at all. So in other words, I'm using my muscles of breathing, but how much air comes in and out is up to me. And as much as possible, I'm not thinking breathe in, breathe out. I think the biggest mm. mistake in Pranayama is that people think suck air in, push air out. Whereas what I'm thinking is expand and contract like the tide. So for mm. example, when people breathe in, I had a test on my anatomy course, and I say, true or false? When you breathe into your chest, your chest gets bigger. And the answer, of course, is false. Because it's not when you breathe in your chest that your chest gets bigger. It's when you make your chest bigger, air comes in. So if I were to say to you, here's my hands, I'm going to pull them apart. And there's a suction. So if I say to you, when I put air between my hands, it pushes my hands apart, that's obviously false. It's when I pull my hands apart and increase the volume between my hands, that causes air to come in. So similarly, if I expand my chest, the chest opens before the air comes in. If I expand my whole trunk, including descending my diaphragm downwards, that's what draws the air in. It's not sucking the air in. And similarly, if I want to exhale, I don't think squeeze out air, I think compress my trunk. And I just Mm. massage. And it's like a massage. You know sometimes in a massage, people push you, they press you. But sometimes people pull the skin. And so I'm doing that. I'm Uh, doing a massage which my body's being pulled Yeah, and I can see that very clearly in your movements. Yeah, yeah. And Mm, so to mm. teach that, I teach people to do movements which are a bit bigger. I teach them to move like that. Then I open their pelvic yeah. floor, their lower back, their upper back, their chest, their abdomen, and contracts. Lower abdomen, lower back, upper back, chest, abdomen. But once they learn it, I can have them in this position or any position and do the expansion and contraction. Then it looks like I'm just doing rapid breathing. <laughs> inhale and exhale. Inhale, exhale. But I can move the, I can move the trunk and the abdomen, whether I'm breathing or not. I don't need to breathe to do this. And if I've got clothes on, you're not even going to see that movement. 